It's going to be boring and short, <clears throat> but I got to, if I want to make it short, I've got to start right away fast. Okay, contest statement 29. The continuing population flow from the cities to the suburbs. The internal migrations from the Rust Belt to the Sun Belt. And the increase in immigration resulting from the passage of the 1965 Immigration Act. All of those have had social and political effects. Cities to suburbs, Rust Belt to Sun Belt, new immigration, all had political and social effects. What in the world? Are you kidding? Remember when we looked at history, uh, immigration before, and we talked about a first wave of immigration and a second wave of immigration and blah, blah, blah. And Northern Europe and, and Western Europe and Eastern Europe and Southern Europe. Okay. So let me just show you here. Should have had this ready already. I did put up a U.S. map, but I forgot I would need a, a Europe map. If you're looking at the first wave of immigration back before the Civil War, early 1800s, you're talking about Denmark, England, Ireland, Germany. You're talking about this part, North West Europe. That's the first wave of immigration. A lot of our, if you have German ancestors, and I want to say our, I mean, my, my family, you know, was from this region right in here. Beavers used to be Bieber. Uh, you know, a lot of, if, if you have German ancestors or Irish, most likely, most likely your parents or your, your, your people came over to the U.S., to the U.S. Uh, early 1800s. Southern and Eastern Europe, Russians, Italians, Polish folk, Serbian folk, Austrian folk, Greeks and Turks, South and East, Jewish people, plus Chinese and Japanese way over here are part of the second wave of immigration. That was late 1800s, early 1900s after the Civil War. So this one before the Civil War, this one down here after the Civil War, right? Okay. Now what is going on in America in the third wave of immigration? This is in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, right? We've got a couple things going on here. First, we've got Rust Belt. Rust Belt right here. Why is it called the Rust Belt? Because there were lots and lots of factories and industry up here, and they're starting to die off. Foreign competition is starting to take the place of a lot of car manufacturers and steel manufacturers and oil well, oil drilling and refining plants, etc., 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 right? And those jobs are being shipped overseas or it's just cheaper to do it in China or Mexico or whatever, right? So uh, a lot of the jobs that were up here in the factories, the factories are starting to be empty. The factories are starting to rust. So literally we are part of the rust belt. Jobs were moving instead to places where it's sunny in warm technically the sun belt would be in this region right here the south texas california arizona this is where since the 60s people have been moving remember great migration had african americans going from here to the north now people of all races are moving to down here, which is made possible by air conditioning because people can actually live in the humid Texas death heat. And this is where the jobs are going to. In addition, the 1965 Immigration Act 
allows a lot more people from Mexico in Latin America, a lot more people from Africa and Asia in. So the third wave of immigration, we are not talking about Europeans as much anymore. We're talking about Hispanics, we're talking about people from Africa, um, India, etc. So getting back to this thing, the post-war movement from cities to suburbs had political and social effects that included white flight, white people leaving inner cities to move to the suburbs and discriminatory loan practices towards minorities. When those people moved from, those white folks moved from inner cities to outlying neighborhoods, they would often have these codes of conduct written into their neighborhood rules that said, uh, we will not allow people of color to move in our neighborhood. Or the federal government would even draw red lines around certain neighborhoods and say, inside here, it's too risky to allow people of color to be in here because we don't think that they will pay back their loans. It was obvious discrimination, even after the civil rights movement, and it's, it was still going on. So you won't find as many people of color in suburbs because of these types of things. The polarization of urban and rural voters. People who are moving out of the cities tend to be Republican conservative. You're not going to find very many people voting for Joe Biden down in the Hocking Hills, but you will not find many people voting Trump inside of big cities. It just won't happen. There's a divide. There's a split. Rural, Republican, urban, Democrat. It just happens. It just happened. Um, there are also urban riots that went on through the 60s um, as the civil rights movement seemed to not gain as much steam and success as some people thought there should be. There's some of the race and voting habits here. Residents of the Rust Belt region. Again, remember Rust Belt up in here. We're being drawn by the employment opportunities offered by defense plants and high tech industries located in the South and California. We call that part of the country, the Sun Belt, where it's more sunny here and here. This led to migration. This migration led to the growth of the Sun Belt. This development contributed to a political power shift in the country that affected the reapportionment of congressional districts. What this basically means is there are more members of the House of Representatives in Southern states now than there were before because people are moving down here and the house is based on population. So Texas has a lot of electoral votes. Florida has a lot of electoral votes. Georgia was a battleground state with more electoral votes than maybe they had before. Ohio's electoral votes are shrinking because people are moving from up in here to down in here. And of course there's also uh, more, not only are there more electoral votes, but there's also more members of Congress too, members of the House of Representatives. So the Southern states, the Sun Belt seems to have a lot more political power than it used to. The 1965 Immigration Act allowed more individuals from Asia, Africa, and Latin America to enter the United States. This represents that third wave of immigration that I was talking about. The immigration that followed impacted the country's demographic or population makeup. For example, Hispanics became the fastest growing minority in the United States. There are more, I think, there are more Hispanics in the country than there are African Americans in the country now. Because after this law was passed, there have been more Hispanic people come and get citizenship. Um, right? And that's just that they're the second as far as i can tell you can look this up but as far as i remember the hispanic population is the second highest um, people group in the united states now and this led to increased spanish language media 
ESPN Deportes, right? There's always this SAP button that you can push on your remote control so you can hear what's going on in Spanish. El Palomar has a ton of different Spanish language television shows on, and I think the other two um, Mexican restaurants in town do too. And there's a lot more funding for bilingual education programs because of the rise of these different people groups coming to the United States, English as a second language programs. These demographic changes impacted voting practices and the balance of power between the major political parties. In essence, immigration has now bolstered the number of voters specifically for the Democratic Party. There are very few immigrant groups that tend to vote Republican. Cubans, stereotypically. Maybe some Asian groups, but for the most part, it, it, it seems like the Democratic Party has gotten the vote of the immigrant. If you have questions, let me know. I know this is a lot of information.